it's a series that that uh, that was made in spite of a lot of things, in spite of uh, lack of interest on the part of the network, in spite of terrible budgets, uh, in spite of of uh, the fact that it was trying to be really good science fiction at a time when Lost in Space was was. The, the nature of science fiction being done successfully. It certainly was a big gamble for Desilu, uh, who had never before faced the kind of needs that a, a sci-fi show like this engenders. We made those series then for, uh, and this is not an exaggeration, probably the catering bill for a series made today, for what it costs to feed the crew, cast and crew, for uh, a week and a half. That's what we made an hour show on. Nobody expected the show to take off years later, so they weren't spending much money on us. It almost shouldn't have been done. It's, it's, it's a series that, that, that was made in spite of all of these problems, in spite of itself, in a sense. Green! Did you see this? Yes, sir. Sturgeon was dead when I found him. I was circling to find whatever it was. Same red rings on his face. The man trap was chosen by the network and theref therefore also by the studio because they wanted the network to be happy and uh, we had not very many other better ideas, uh, including one of which was mine for a show called The Naked Time. I felt that The Naked Time would display our characters uh, to best advantage and uh, give the audience an idea of who the show is about. But I got shot down and uh, and we went with Man Trap and the Salt Eater, and uh, a good time was had by all. It was pretty much, you know, what have you got? And uh, then we make a choice. And well, that's what we've got. Uh, they didn't realize just how poverty stricken we were when it came to viewable episodes. Because uh, we were really up against it uh, for time. I'm in control of my emotions. The others believe that. I don't. The Naked Time uh, was challenging. It was an episode where a, a virus was brought on board accidentally that was passed person to person by touch. If I had it and shook your hand, you got it. And what it did was eliminated people's defenses. So they started acting out their personal fantasies or secrets or whatever. Uh, Sulu became a swordsman, dashing around with his, with his saber and attacking people. In most of the episodes, I was just anchored there at the uh, console. And my lines were, you know, pretty much uh, pre-written for me and pre-memorized before this script even arrived. I, I, sir, warp three, you know. I mean, but with this script, Naked Time, I got unchained. Drunkenness without staggering and slurring. Uh, no, that was the essence of the story. If you think about it, that's what happened. Uh, people did goofy things, racing around like a drunk would do. <laughs> John Black, the writer who wrote that script, happened to be on the set, uh, oh, about a month before we, that uh, episode was shot, and he told me that he was uh, thinking of putting a, a samurai sword in my hand to terrorize the rest of the crew because of the virus that tore down our inhibitions. And I told him, well, that's uh, interesting, and it's certainly ethnically consistent because I'm of Japanese ancestry. But I told him, you know, I'm um, a Japanese American. I grew up here and I didn't play samurai when I was a kid. I uh, played Robin Hood. Uh, so what about a fencing foil in uh, Sulu's hand? John said, well, that's a great idea. Do you fence? I said, of course. <laughs> it's my favorite hobby. <laughs> that night I had the yellow pages open and looking down fencing schools. I found one on Hollywood Boulevard, the Falcon Studios, and that Saturday I was taking my first formal uh, fencing lesson. My life had come full circle. 
And I was able to bring that two weeks worth of uh, frenzied fencing lesson taking to that episode. I'm in control of my emotions. Control. The first draft of the script that came down, as I recall, had Spock, uh, elevator door opens, and out comes Spock, who's got the bug now, and Spock is crying. And a crewman, who's being kind of silly and painting graffiti on the walls in the, in the ship, has a paintbrush, dips in the paintbrush, and paints a mustache on the crying Spock. And Spock walks down the hall crying. I understood it, but I thought it was a lost opportunity. And this gentleman came on the set and said, OK, tell me again what you have in mind. I said, look, all you have to do is put me in a room by myself. Let me walk into a room, close the door behind me, because Spock would like some privacy when this is happening to him. And give me some words that have to do with science and emotion and mother and love. So he put some words down with just about pretty much what I just said. Mark Daniels, wonderful director, had devised a shot that was kind of complicated where the camera moved around me, kind of encircled me, and, and come up on the other side and see my face and the tears are streaming and I'm in this struggle. There wasn't time to do this more than once. Justin's behind the camera creeping, watching, you know, and I could feel him out of the corner of my eye as I'm playing the scene. And uh, we got it done. When that show went on the air, my, my mail just went like that. It really uh, resonated with people. They really got it. They knew what, what it was all about. It was like they were let in on the secret of Spock's life. And they cared about it, and they responded to it. It was a tremendously important episode for Spock. <laughs> Part of the attraction of Star Trek, I thought, were the action sequences. They always are. You aim for an audience, and maybe there are the cliché uh, observation that maybe women of a certain age wouldn't like action sequences, but then we are filled with clichés, and especially back then even more. I loved the idea of setting up action sequences, and in these fights that we would have with these monsters, you know, the aliens, uh, since they were capable of different things, we had to outwit them. It pushed us, the, the people making the series, to think of new and different ways to fight and have action sequences in which we could compensate for our lack of brawn with brain or, if they were brainier, with our brawn. We are dealing with a silicon creature of the deep rocks capable of moving through solid rock as easily as we move through the air. That would account for the tunnels. Correct. Devil in the Dark, an, an excellent episode. It was about something important for me. It was about the way we tend to demonize the things that we don't know or understand, or the people that we don't know or understand. Captain, you're aware of the Vulcan technique of the joining of two minds. You think you can get through that thing? possible. It was complicated because Bill Shatner's father died during the making of that episode and he had to go off to Florida to uh, deal with uh, the funeral and what have you. While he was gone, I was doing this contact with the Horda, doing this mind meld where I'm getting in touch with what it's experiencing and we have shot it and it's in pain and I'm, ref I'm experiencing that pain with it and I'm I don't remember exactly how I did it, but it was something like, pain, pain, something like that. Maybe bigger than that. And Bill was not there. Pain! Now he came back two or three days later, and now it's time to put the camera on him. There was one shot where they shot across a double's shoulder. So you thought that Bill was in the scene while I'm doing that, but it was not Bill, it was a double. But now the camera has to turn around, and we have to see Bill reacting to this. So he comes back and we turn the camera around on him. And he said, well, can Leonard show me what he did? I said, sure, I'll show you. So I walk over to the position and I, I, do, I said, it was something like this, Bill was pain, pain. And he said, uh, is that exactly the way you did it? I said, no, not exactly. Well, show me exactly what you did. Pain, pain. No, he said, let me, let me see what you really did. So I, pain, pain. And Bill was devilish, with a gleam in his eye, turns to the crew and says, would somebody give this guy an aspirin? 
He just sucked me right into it, you know, <laughs> having a good time with me. I wanted to kill him. <laughs> well, uh, Bill had that kind of a warped sense of humor. This is 13 years ago. The Enterprise. And its commander, Captain Christopher Pike. We were running short of scripts. And I used to watch the progress of the scripts through the story and teleplay procedure. I realized that we would soon be out of scripts to film, and if something didn't occur, we'd have to, quote, shut down, unquote. Oh my God, what a terrible thing to even contemplate. But that's what was going to happen. And at that time, I went to Gene, and uh, I don't know whether he knew it was coming or not. I said, Gene, either you write what, we, what he described as the envelope, or we shut down. Well, that was a job and a half. I worked on it very, very hard uh, to try and put new stuff with old stuff because we couldn't waste that first pilot. So Gene said, make it work. It was a really tough job and one of the toughest jobs I think I've had. Mr. Spock had related to us your strength of will. We need the breathing space that two finished scripts can give us so we can get the rest of our shows done writing and into production. He could not face the issue and he went home and he stayed in the office and he wrote for I don't remember how many days it was and he was delivered of the sandwich episodes. And we had two more scripts that we could use and we made it. We came within a week of failing to meet our air date. And that happened time after time that first season. Khan is my name. Khan, nothing else. Khan. The original episode that I um, had the pleasure of, which I had the pleasure to work, Space Seed, God, so many years ago. I remember as being rather intimate. I remember having a very good eye-to-eye -eye contact with Bill Shatner. The atmosphere was very pleasant. The text seemed to me that it was ahead of its time. It was interesting to do. Captain, although your abilities intrigue me, you are quite honestly inferior mentally, physically. In fact, I am surprised how little improvement there has been in human evolution. Oh, there has been technical advancement, but uh, how little man himself has changed. Khan was a super, superman, really. Superior strength, superior intellect. When it came to love, love became a very simple, beautiful thing to him. And that's what I found fascinating about the man. I have played many, many different kinds of roles because after I left MGM, I was um, left alone to fend from, by myself and support my family. So I had to do all kinds of things, including I did any number of television appearances. In every time, I portray a character never thinking that if he's a gangster or a killer, or, never think he's evil. I'm sure that the worst criminal in the world doesn't think of himself as being evil. I think perhaps I, I was able to achieve a certain, if not vulnerability, at least some kind of humanity in the character. You must excuse my whimsical way of fetching you here, but when I saw you passing by, I simply could not resist. Well, I got a call from Gene Kuhn, and I didn't know him. And I wondered, what is this guy calling me for? and he had informed me that he had a part for me. But he wanted to talk to me first. Because there was a fellow by the name of Joe Agosta who was the casting, and he didn't think I could do it. He said, Bill Campbell is a tough guy from New Jersey, and uh, he's done a lot of war pictures, uh, Battle Cry, The Naked and the Dead, and things like that. He said, but I don't see him uh, in, in this part. He sends me the script, and I started reading it, and I said, holy Christ, I mean, <laughs> this is a great role, an actor's dream. I digested it that night. I practically knew it 
by heart. If it's fighting that you want, you may have it. Are you challenging me to a duel? If you have the courage. Oh, this is better than I'd planned. I shall not shirk an affair of honor. Of all the things I've done, and I won't say one is better than the other, but in that group, of all the series I've done, the uh, Star Trek episodes are the most fun uh, in my lifetime. I will never have another part like the Squire. Never. One day soon, man is going to be able to harness incredible energies, maybe even the atom, energies that could ultimately hurl us to other worlds in, in some sort of spaceship. I think uh, City on the Edge of Forever uh, was another very poetic, wonderful script by Harlan and Ellison, which I thought was very special, very good. Great love story for Bill Shatner with Joan Collins. And a script that did not have a happy ending. Uh, his love dies and he has to let it happen. Tragic ending in which he finally, he, I think his final line is, let's get the hell out of here. It was good tragedy if there is such a thing, good dramatic construction where the tragic event is in inevitable, has to happen, and uh, well written and, and well, uh, well produced and directed. I believe it was written that way. The awe that uh, it engendered wasn't. You know, we all were suitably impressed. And uh, I just remember the sh the, that setup where the three of them jumped through the hoop, so to speak, and disappeared into the past, or, you know, or possibly the future. It was, uh, it was an amazing moment. I imagine it came from the set description, but it was an odd looking thing. It, we called it, I think we called it the donut. And it was very mysterious looking. And, uh, you know, you could really believe for the first time I felt that this is a true science fiction show. It had, but, the, but that episode had everything. And uh, it, it is rightfully so uh, the belief by most of the fans that it was the best episode of the whole three years of the series. Spark. I believe I'm in love with Edith Keeler. Jim, Edith Keeler must die. The best episodes of Star Trek reached for a universal something that resonated, uh, a feeling that we all have. And uh, there, everybody's had the feeling, gosh, I wish I could go back and fix that. And of course you can. And regret is the worst of human emotions because there's nothing you can do about it. So there we went back in time and tried to do something about it. No, Jim. 